Greeting friends. Welcome to the Morgan Library's Interpretation and Celebration of World Science Fiction Day. So it's a science fiction day for all of those who love a little outre, a little sci-fi, all the wonderful things that make this world so wonderful for fiction. Today we are reading a classic of the science fiction genre, War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, written in the latter half of the 19th century, one of the first to mention interstellar war, and also must be said, a dramatic reading similar to this one actually caused very a lot of people to call in in the 1930s to wonder if the world had actually been invaded by Martians. So, to start us off, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Chapter 1, The Eve of the War. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. That as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. It is possible that the infusoria under the microscope do the same. No one gave a thought to the older worlds of space as sources of human danger, or thought of them only to dismiss the idea of life upon them as impossible or improbable. It is curious to recall some of the mental habits of those departed days. At most, terrestrial man fancied there might be other men upon Mars, perhaps inferior to themselves, and ready to welcome a missionary enterprise. Yet across the gulf of space, minds that are to our minds as ours are those to that are yet across the gulf of space, minds that are that yet across the gulf of space, minds that are to our minds as ours are to those of the beasts that perish. Intellects vast and cool and unsympathetic regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. And early in the 20th century came the great disillusionment. The planet Mars, I scarcely need to remind the reader, revolves about the sun at a mean distance of 140 million miles, and the heat and light it receives from the sun is barely half of that received by this world. It must be, if the nebula hypothesis has any truth, older than our world. And long before this Earth ceased to be molten, life upon its surface must have begun its course. The fact that it is scarcely one-seventh of the volume of Earth must have accelerated its cooling to the temperature at which life could begin. It has air and water, and all that is necessary for the support of animated existence. <coughs> Yet so vain is man, and so blinded by his vanity, that no writer up until the very end of the 19th century expressed any idea that intelligent life might have developed there far, or indeed at all, beyond its earthly level. Nor was it generally understood that since Mars is older than our Earth, with scarcely a quarter of the superficial area and, rem and remoter from the, uh, from the Sun, nor was it generally understood that since Mars is older than our Earth, with scarcely a quarter of the superficial area and remoter from the Sun, it necessarily follows that it is not only more distant from life's beginning, but nearer its end. The secular cooling that must someday overtake our planet has already gone far indeed with our neighbor. Its physical condition is still largely a mystery, but we now know that even in its equatorial region, the midday temperature barely approaches that of a cold winter. Its air is much more attenuated than ours. Its oceans have shrunk until they cover but a third of its surface. And as its slow seasons change, huge snow caps gather and melt about either pole and periodically inundate its temperate zones. That last stage of exhaustion, which to us is still incredibly remote, has become a present-day problem for the inhabitants of Mars. The immediate pressure of necessity has brightened their intellects, enlarged their powers, and hardened their hearts. And looking across space with instruments and intelligences such as we have scarcely dreamed of, they see, at its nearest distance, only 35 million of miles sunward of them, a morning star of hope, our own warmer planet, green with vegetation and gray with water, 
with a cloudy atmosphere eloquent of fertility, with glimpses through its drifting cloud wisps of broad stretches of populous country and narrow, navy-crowded seas. And we men, the creatures who inhabit this earth, must be to them at least as alien and lowly as are the monkeys and lemurs are to us. The intellectual side of man already admits that life is an incessant struggle for, for existence, and it would seem that this too is the belief of the minds of all Mars. Their world is far gone from its cooling, and this world is still crowded with life, but crowded only with what they regard as inferior animals. To carry warfare sunward is indeed their only escape from the, from the destruction that generation after generation creeps upon them. And before we judge of them too harshly, we must remember what ruthless and utter des destruction our own species has wrought, not only upon animals, such as the vanished bison and the dodo, but upon its own inferior races. The Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely wiped out of existence in a war of extermination waged by European immigrants in the space of 50 years. Are we such apostles of mercy as to complain that the Martians warred in the same spirit? The Martians seem to have calculated their descent with amazing subtlety. The mathematical learning is evidently far in excess of ours, and to have carried out their preparations with a well-nigh perfect unanimity. Had our instruments permitted it, we might have seen the gathering trouble far back in the 19th century. Men like Schiaparelli, Schi men like Schiaparelli, men like Schiaparelli, watched the red planet. It is odd, by the way, that for countless centuries Mars has been the star of war, but failed to interpret the fluctuating appearances of the markings they mapped so well. All that time, the Martians must have been doing well. During the opposition of 1894, a great light receipt was seen on the illuminated part of the disk, first at the Lick Observatory, then by Periton of Nice, and then by other observers. English readers first heard of it in the issue of Nature dated August 2nd. I am inclined to, to think that this blaze must have been the casting of a huge gun from a vast pit sunk into their planet, from which their shots were fired at us. Peculiar markings, as yet unexplained, was seen near the site of that outbreak during the next two oppositions. The storm burst upon us six years ago now. As Mars approached opposition, Lavelle of Java set the wires of the astronomical exchange palpitating with the amazing intelligence of a huge outbreak of incandescent gas upon the planet. It had occurred towards midnight of the 12th, and the spectroscope, to which he had at once resorted, indicated a mass of flaming gas chiefly hydrogen, moving with an enormous velocity towards this earth. This jet of flame had become invisible at a quarter past twelve. He compared it to a colossal puff of flame suddenly and violently squirted out of the planet as flaming gases rushed out of a gun. A singularly appropriate phrase it proved, yet on the next day there was nothing of this in the papers except a little note in the Daily Telegraph and the world went on in ignorance of one of the gravest dangers that ever threatened the human race. I might not have known, heard of the eruption at all, had I not met Ogilvy, the well-known astronomer, at Ottershaw. He was immensely excited by the news, and in the excess of his feelings invited me up to take a turn with him that night in a scrutiny of the red planet. In spite of all that has happened since, I still remember that vigil very distinctly. The black and silent observatory, the shadowed lantern throwing a feeble glow upon the floor in the corner, the steady ticking of the clockwork of the telescope, the little slit in the roof, an oblong profundity with the stardust streaked across it. Ogilvy moved about, invisible but audible. Looking through the telescope, one saw a circle of deep blue and a little red planet swimming in the heat. It seemed such a little so bright and small and still, faintly marked with transverse stripes and slightly flattened from the perfect round. But so little it was, so silvery warm, a, a pin's head of light. It was as if it quivered, but really this was a telescope vibrating with the activity of the clockwork that kept the planet in view. As I watched, the planet seemed to grow larger and smaller, and to advance and recede, but that was simply that my eyes caught. 
40 millions of miles it was from us. More than 40 millions of miles away. Few people realize the immensity of the vacancy in which the dust of the material universe swims. Near it in the field, I remember, were three faint points of light. Three telescopic stars, infinitely remote, and all around it was the unfathomable darkness of empty space. You know how that blackness looks in the frosty starlit night. In a telescope, it seems far profounder and invisible to me because it was so remote and small, flying swiftly and steadily towards me across that incredible distance, drawing nearer by minute by every many thousands of miles, came the thing that was sending us. The thing that was to bring so much struggle and calamity and death to the earth. I never dreamed of it then as I watched. No one on earth dreamed of that unerring missile. That other night, too, there was another jetting out of gas from the distant planet. I saw it. A reddish flash at the edge, the slightest projection of the outline just as the chronometer struck midnight, and at that I told Ogilvy and he took my place. The night was warm. And I was thirsty, and I went, stretching my legs clumsily and feeling my way in the darkness to the little table where the siphon stood, while Ogilvy exclaimed at the streamer of gas that came out towards us. That night, another invisible missile started on its way to the Earth from Mars, just a second or so under 24 hours after the first one. I remember how I sat on the table there in the blackness, with patches of green and crimson swimming before my eyes. I wished I had a light smoke on, little suspecting the, mean, the meaning of the, in, of the minute gleam I had seen and all that it would presently bring me. Ogilvy watched it well, then gave it up, and we lit the lantern and walked over to his house. Down in the darkness below were Ottershaw and Chertsey and all their hundreds of people sleeping in peace. He was full of speculation that night about the condition of Mars and scoffed at the vulgar idea of its happening inhabitants were signaling. His idea was that meteorites might be falling in a heavy shower upon the planet, or that a huge volcanic explosion was in progress. He pointed out to me how unlikely it was that organic evolution had taken the same direction in the two adjacent planets. The chances against anything man-like on Earth are on Mars are a million to one, he said. Hundreds of observers saw the flame that night and the night after at about midnight, and again the night after, and so for ten nights a flame a night. Why the shot ceased after the tenth, no one on earth has attempted to explain. It may be the gases of the firing caused the Martians inconvenience. Dense clouds of smoke or dust, visible through a powerful telescope on earth as little gray fluctuating patches, spread through the clearness of the planet's atmosphere and obscured its more familiar features. Even the daily papers woke up to the disturbances at last, and popular notes appeared here, there, and everywhere concerning the volcanoes upon Mars. The serial comic period, periodical Punch, I remember, made a happy use of it in the political cartoon. And, all unsuspected, those missiles the Martians had fired us drew Earth rushing now at a pace of many miles a second through the empty gulf of space, hour by hour and day by day, nearer and nearer. It seems to me now how almost incredibly wonderful that, with that swift fate hanging over us, men could go about their petty concerns as they did. I remember how jubilant Markham was at securing a new photograph of the planet for the illustrated paper he edited in those days. People in the these latter days, scarcely realized the abundance and enterprise of our 19th century papers. For my own part, I was much occupied in learning to ride the bicycle, and busy upon a series of papers discussing the probable developments of moral ideas as civilization progressed. One night, this first missile then could scarcely have been 10 million miles away, I went for a walk with my wife. It was Starlight and I explained the signs of the zodiac to her, and pointed out Mars, a bright dot of light creeping zenithward, towards which many telescopes were pointing. It was a warm night. Coming home, a party of excursionists from Chertsey or Owsworth had passed us singing and playing music. There were lights in the upper windows of the houses as the people went to bed. 
from the railway station in the distance came the sound of shunting trains, ringing and rumbling, softened almost into melody by the distance. My wife pointed out to me the brightness of the red, green, and yellow signal lights hanging in the framework against the sky. It seemed so safe and tame. Chapter 2 But then came the night of the first falling star. It was seen early in the morning rushing over Winchester eastward, a line of flame high in the atmosphere. Hundreds must have seen it and taken it for an ordinary falling star. Alban described it as leaving a greenish streak behind it that glowed for some seconds. Denning, our highest authority on meteorites, stated that the height of its first appearance was about 90 or 100 miles. It seemed to him that it fell to earth about 100 miles east of it. I was at home at that hour and writing in my study, and although my French windows faced towards Aubuchon and the blind was up, for I loved in those days to look up at the night sky, I saw nothing of it. Yet this strangest of all things that ever came to earth from outer space must have fallen while I was sitting there, visible to me had I only looked up as it passed. Some of those who saw its flight say it traveled with a hissing sound. I myself heard nothing of that. Many people in Berkshire, Surrey, and Middlesex have, must have seen the fall of it, and at most have thought that another meteorite had descended. No one seems to have troubled to look for the fallen night sky now. But very early in the morning, poor Olden, who had seen the shooting star and was persuaded that a meteorite lay somewhere on the common between Horsell, Wortershire, and Woking, rose early with the idea of finding it. Find it he did soon after dawn, and not far from the sand pits. An enormous hole had been made by the impact of the projectile, and the sand and gravel had been flung violently in every direction over the heap, forming heaps visible a mile and a half away. The heather was on fire eastward, and a thin blue smoke rose against the dawn. The thing itself lay almost entirely buried in sand, Amidst the scattered splinters of a fir tree, it had shivered to fragments in its descent. The uncovered part had the appearance of a huge cylinder, caked over, and its outline softened by a thick, scaly, dun-colored incrustation. It had a diameter of about thirty yards. He approached the mass, surprised at the size, and more so at the shape, since most meteorites are rounded more or less completely. It was, however, still so hot from its flight through the air as to forbid his near approach. A stirring noise within its cylinder he ascribed to the unequal cooling of its surface, for at that time it might it had not occurred to him that it might be hollow. He remained standing at the edge of the pit that the thing had made for itself, staring at its strange appearance, astonished chiefly at its unusual shape and color, and dimly perceiving even then some evidence of design of its arrival. The early morning was wonderfully still, and the sun, just clearing the pine trees towards Weymouth, was already warming. He, he did not remember hearing any birds that morning. There was certainly no breeze stirring, and the only sounds were the faint movements from within the cindery cylinder. He was all alone in the coffin. Then suddenly he noticed with a start that some of the grey clinker the ashy incrustation that covered the meteorite was falling off at the circular edge of the inner one. It was dropping off in flakes and raining down upon the sand. A large piece suddenly came off and fell with a sharp nose, noise that brought his heart into his mouth. For a moment he scarcely realized what this meant, and although the heat was excessive, he clambered down into the pit close to the bowl to see the thing more clearly. He fancied even then that the cooling of the body might account for this, but what disturbed that idea was the fact that the ash was falling only from the end of the cylinder. And then he perceived that, very slowly, the circular top of the cylinder was rotating on its bottom. It was such a gradual movement that he discovered only through noticing that a black mark that had been near him five minutes ago was now at the other end of the circumference. Even then, he scarcely understood what this indicated until he heard a muffled grating sound and saw the black mark jerk forward an inch or so. Then the thing came upon him like a flash. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. 
Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens, said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half rose to the death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the out with the out flash upon Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. At that he stood irresolute for a moment, then turned, scrambled out of the pit, and set off running wildly into water. The time there must have been somewhere about six o'clock. He met a wagoner and tried to make him understand, but the tale he told and his appearance were so wild, his hat had fallen off the pit, that the man simply drove home. He was equally unsuccessful with the potman, who was just unlocking the doors of the public house across the bridge. The fellow thought he was a lunatic at large and made an unsuccessful attempt to shut him in the taproom. That sobered him a little, and when he saw Henderson, the London journalist, in his garden, he called over the palings and made himself understood. Henderson, he called, you saw that shooting star thing last night? No, said Henderson. It's out on Horse or Comet now. Good Lord, said Henderson. Fallen meteorite, that's good. But it's something more than a meteorite. It's a cylinder, an artificial cylinder, man. And there's something inside. Henderson stood up with the spade in his hand. What's that? He said. He was deaf in one ear. Ogilvy told him all that he had seen. Henderson was a minute or so taking it in. Then he dropped his spade, snatched up his jacket, and came out into the road. The two men hurried back at once to the car, and found the cylinder still lying in the same position. But now the sounds inside had ceased, and a thin circle of bright metal showed between the top and the body of the cylinder. Air was, was either entering or escaping at the rim with a thin sizzling sound. They listened, wrapped on the scaly burnt metal with a stick, and, even with a response, they both concluded the man or men inside must be insensible or dead. Of course, the two were quite unable to do anything. They shouted consolation and promises, and went off back to the town again to get help. One can imagine them, covered with sand, excited and disordered, running up to the street in the bright sunlight just as the shop folks were taking down their shutters and people were opening their bedroom windows. Henderson went into the railway station at once in order to telegraph the news to London. The newspaper articles had prepared men's minds for the reception of the idea. By eight o'clock, a number of boys and unemployed men had already started for the common to see the dead men of Mars. That was the form the story took. I heard of it first from my newspaper boy at a quarter to nine when I went out to get my daily chronicle. I was naturally startled and lost no time in getting out and across the other shore bridge to the sand pits. Chapter three. I found a little crowd of perhaps twenty people surrounding the huge hole in which the cylinder lay. I have already described the appearance of that colossal bulk embedded in the ground. The turf and gravel about it seemed charred as if by a violent explosion. No doubt its impact had caused a flash of fire. Henderson and Ogilvy were not there. I think they perceived that nothing was to be done for the present and had gone away to breakfast at Henderson's house. There were four or five boys sitting on the edge of the pit, with their feet dangling, and amusing themselves, until I stopped them, by throwing stones at the giant mass. After I had spoken to them about it, they began playing at touch-in and out of the group of bystanders. Among these were a couple of cyclists, a jobbing gardener I employed sometimes, a girl carrying a baby, Greg the butcher and his little boy, and two or three loafers and golf caddies who were accustomed to hang about the railway station. There was very little talking. Few of the common people in England had anything but the vaguest astronomical ideas in those days. Most of them were staring quietly at the big table-like end of the cylinder, which was still as Ogilvy and Henderson had left it. I fancy the popular expectation of a heap of charred corpses was disappointed at this inanimate bulk. Some went away while I was there, and other people came. I clambered into the pit and fancied I heard a slight movement under my feet. The top had certainly ceased to rotate. It was only when I got thus to it that the strangeness of this object was at first at all evident to me. 
At the first glance, it was really no more exciting than an overturned carriage or a tree blown across the road. <laughs> Not so much so, even. It looked like it was a rusty gas flame. It required a certain amount of scientific education to perceive that the grey scale of the thing was no common upset, that the yellowish-white metal that gleamed in the crack between the lid and the cylinder had an unfamiliar hue. Extraterrestrial had no meaning for most of the onlookers. At that time, it was quite clear in my own mind that the thing had come from the planet Mars, but I judged it improbable that it contained any living creature. I thought the unscrewing might be on the map. In spite of Ogilvy, I still believed that there were men in Mars. My men, my mind ran fantifully on the, on the possibilities of it containing manuscripts, on the difficulties in translation that might arise, whether we should find coins and models in it, and so forth. Yet it was a little too large for assurance in this idea. I felt an impatience to see it open. About eleven, as nothing seemed happening, I walked back, full of such thoughts, to my home in Maybury, but I found it difficult to get to work upon my abstract investigations. In the afternoon, the appearance of the common had altered very much. The early editions of the evening papers had startled London with enormous headlines, A Message Received from Mars, Remarkable Story from Walking, and so forth. In addition, Ogilvy's wire to the Astronomical Exchange had roused every observatory in the Three Kingdoms. There were half a dozen pleas or more from the walking station standing in the road by the sand pits, a basket chaise from Chobham, and a rather lordly carriage. Beside that, there was quite a heap of bicycles. In addition, a large number of people must have walked, in spite of the heat of the day, from walking in Chertsey, so that there were altogether quite a considerable crowd, one or two gaily dressed ladies among the others. It was glaringly hot. Not a cloud in the sky, nor a breath of wind, and the only shadow was that of the few scattered pine trees. The burning heather had been extinguished, but the level ground towards Ottershaw was blackened as far as one could see, and still giving off vertical streamers of smoke. An enterprising sweet stuff dealer in the Chobham Road had sent up his son with a barrow load of green apples and ginger beer. Going to the edge of the I found it occupied by a group of about half a dozen men, Henderson, Ogilvy, and a tall, fair-haired man that I afterwards learned was Stent, the Astronomer Royal, with several workmen wielding spades and pickaxes. Stent was giving directions in a high, high-pitched voice and clear. He was standing on the cylinder, which was now evidently much cooler. His face was crimson and streaming with perspiration, and something seemed to have irritated him. A large portion of the cylinder had been uncovered, though its lower end was still embedded. As soon as Ogilvy saw me among the staring crowd on the edge of the pit, he asked me to, he called to me to come down and asked me if I wouldn't mind going to, over to see Lord Hilton, the lord of the manor. The growing crowd, he said, was becoming a serious impediment to their investigations, especially the boys. They wanted a light railing put up and help to keep the people back. He told me, that a faint stirring was occasionally still audible within the case, but that the workmen had failed to unscrew the top as it afforded no grip to them. The case appeared to be enormously thick, and it was possible that the faint sound we heard represented a noisy tumult in the interior. I was very glad to do as he asked, and so became one of the privileged spectators within the contemplated enclosure. I failed to find Lord Hilton at his house, but I was told he was expected from London by the six o'clock train from Waterloo, and that was and as it was then about a half past five, I went home, had some tea, and walked up to the station to Whaley. Chapter four. When I returned to the common, the sun was setting. Scattered groups were hurrying from the direction of Wapping, and one or two persons were returning. The crowd at the pit had increased and stood out black against the lemon yellow of the sky, a couple of hundred feet perhaps. There were raised voices, and some sort of struggle seemed to be going on about the pit. Strange imaginings passed through my mind, and as I drew nearer, I heard Stent's voice, Keep back! Keep back! A boy came running toward me. It's a moving! he said to me as he passed. I'm screwing in it! screwing it out! I don't like it! I'm a-going home, I am! I went on to the crowd. 
There were really, I should think, two or three hundred people elbowing and jostling one another, the one or two ladies there being by no means the least attentive. It's falling in the pit, cried someone. Keep back, said several. The crowd swayed a little, and I elbowed my way through. Everyone seemed greatly excited. I heard a peculiar humming sound from the pit. I say, said Ogilvy, keep back those idiots there. We don't know which in the confounded thing you know. I saw a young man, a shop assistant in Bucking, I believe he was, standing on the cylinder and trying to scramble out of the hole again. The crowd had pushed him in. The end of the cylinder was being screwed out from within. Nearly two feet of shining screw projected. Somebody blundered against me, and I narrowly missed being pitched on top of the screw. I turned, and as I did so, the screw must have come out, for the lid of the, of the cylinder fell upon the gravel with a ringing concussion. I struck my elbow into the person behind me, and turned my head towards the thing again. For a moment, that circular cavity seemed perfectly blank. I had the sun set upon it. I think everyone expected to see a man emerge, possibly something a little like us terrestrial men, but in all ess essentials a man. I know I did. But looking, I presently saw something stirring within the shadow, grayish, billowy movements, one above the other, and then two luminous discs, like eyes. Then something resembling a little gray snake, about the thickness of a walking stick, coiled up out of the writhing middle, and wriggled in the air towards me, and then another. A sudden chill came over me. There was a loud shriek from a woman behind. I half turned, keeping my eyes fixed upon the cylinder still from which other tentacles were now projected, and began pushing my way toward, from, the, from the edge of the pit. I saw astonishment giving place to horror on the faces of the people about me. I heard inarticulate exclamations on all sides. There was a general movement backwards. I saw the I saw the shopman struggling still on the edge of the pit. I found myself alone, and saw the people on the other side of the pit running off, stent among them. I looked again at the cylinder, and ungovernable terror gripped me. I stood petrified and stared. A big, grayish, rounded bulk, the size perhaps of a bear, was rising slowly and painfully out of the cylinder. As it bulged up and caught the light, it glistened like wet leather. Two large, dark-colored eyes were regarding me steadfastly. The mass that framed it, the head of the thing, it was rounded, and had, one might say, a face. There was a mouth under the eyes, the lipless brim of which quivered and panted, and dropped saliva. The whole creature heaved and pulsated convulsively. A lank tentacle, tentacular, a lank tentacular Appendage gripped the edge of the cylinder, another swayed toward me. Those who have never seen a living monster can scarcely imagine the strange horror that this purpose. The peculiar V shaped mouth with its pointed upper lip, the absence of brow ridges, the absence of a chin beneath the wedge like lower lip, the incessant quivering of this mouth, the gorgon groups of tentacles, the tumultuous breathing of the lungs in a strange atmosphere. The evident heaviness and painfulness of movement due to the greater gravitational energy of the earth. Above all, the extraordinary intensity of the immense eyes were at once vital, intense, inhuman, crippled, and monstrous. There was something fungoid in the oily brown skin, something in the clumsy deliberation of the tedious movements unspeakably nasty. Even at this first encounter, this first glimpse, I was overcome with disgust and horror. Suddenly the monster vanished. It had toppled over the brim of the cylinder and fallen into the pit, with a thud like the fall of a great mass of leather. I heard it give a peculiar thick cry, and forthwith another of these creatures appeared darkly in the deep shadow of the aperture. I turned and, running madly, made for the first group of trees, perhaps a hundred yards away, but I ran slantingly and stumbling, and I could not avert my face from these things. There, among some pine trees and furze bushes, I stopped, panting, and waited for the development. The common around the sand pits was dotted with people, standing like myself in a half fascinated terror, staring at these creatures, or rather at the, ha the heaped gravel at the edge of the pit in which they lay. And then, 
with a renewed horror, I saw a round black object bobbing up and down on the edge of the pit. It was the head of the shotgun he pointed in, but showing as a little black object against the hot western sky. Now he got his shoulder and knee up, and again he seemed to slip back until only his head was visible. Suddenly he vanished, and I could have fancied a, shriek, a faint shriek had reached me. I had a momentary impulse to go back and help him that my fears overruled. Everything was quite invisible then, hidden by the deep pit and the heap of sand that the fall of the cylinder had made. Anyone coming along the road from Chubham or Walking would have been amazed at the sight. A dwindling multitude of perhaps a hundred people or more, standing in a great irreg irregular circle, in ditches, behind bushes, behind gates and hedges, saying little to one another, and that in short, in, and that in short, excited gap. Anyone coming along the road from Chubham or Walking, anyone coming along the road from Chubham or Walking would have been amazed at the sight. A dwindling multitude of perhaps a hundred people or more standing in a great irregular circle, in ditches, behind bushes, behind gates and hedges, saying little to one another, and that in short, ex excited shouts, and staring, staring hard at a few heaps of sand. The barrow of ginger beer stood, a clear derelict, black against the burning sky, and in the sand pits were a row of deserted vehicles with their, no with their horses feeding out of nosebags or pawing the ground. After the glimpse I had had of the Martians emerging from the cylinder in which they had come to the earth from their planet, a kind of fascination paralyzed my action. I remained standing knee-deep in the heather, staring at the mound that hid them. I was a battleground of fear and curiosity. I did not dare to go back towards the pit, but I felt a compassionate longing to peer into it. I began walking, therefore, in a big curve, seeking some point of vantage and continually looking at the sand heaps that hid these newcomers to our earth. Once a leash of thin black whips, like the arms of an octopus, flashed across the sunset and was immediately withdrawn, and afterwards a thin rod rose up, joint by joint, bearing at its apex a circular disk that spun with a wobbling motion. What could be going on there? Most of the spectators had gathered in one or two groups, one a little crowd towards walking, the other a knot of people in the direction of Chubham. Evidently they shared my mental conflict, but there were few near me. One man I approached, he was, I perceived, a neighbour of mine, though I did not know his name, and accosted him, but it was scarcely a time for articulate conversation. What ugly brutes, he said. Good God, what ugly brutes. He repeated this over and over. Did you see a man in the pit, I said, but he made no answer to me. We became silent, and stood watching for a time side by side, deriving, I fancy, a certain comfort in one another's company. Then I shifted my position to a little knoll that gave me the advantage of a yard or more of elevation, and when I looked for him presently, he was walking towards Walking. The sunset faded to twilight before anything further happened. The crowd farther away on the left, towards Walking, seemed to grow and I heard now a faint murmur from it. The little knot of people towards Chobham dispersed. There was scarcely an intimation of movement from the pit. It was this, as much as anything, that gave people courage, and I suppose the new arrivals from walking also helped to restore confidence. At any rate, as the dusk came on, a slow intermittent movement came upon the sand pits, a movement that seemed to gather force as the stillness of the evening about the cylinder remained unbroken. Vertical black figures in twos and threes would advance, stop, watch and advance again, spreading out as they did so in a thin, irregular crescent that promised to enclose the pit in its attenuated horns. I, too, on my side, began to move towards the pit. Then I saw some cabmen and others had boldly walked into the sand pits and heard the clatter of hooves and the gridle of, and the gride of wheels. I saw a lad trundling off the barrel of apples, and then, within thirty yards of the pit, Advancing from the direction of Horsham, I noticed a little knot of men, the foremost of whom was waving a white flag. This was the deputation. There had been a hasty consultation, and since the Martians were evidently, in spite of their repulsive forms, intelligent creatures, it had been resolved to show them, by approaching them with signals, that we too were intelligent. Flutter, flutter went the flag, first to the left, and then to the right. 
It was too far for me to recognize anyone there. But afterwards, I learned that Ogilvy, Stent, and Henderson were with others in this attempt at communication. This little group had in its advance dragged inward, so as to speak, the circumference of the now almost complete circle of people, and a number of dim black figures followed it at discreet distances. Suddenly there was a flash of light, and a quantity of luminous green smoke came out of the pit in three distinct puffs, which drove up one after the other straight into the still air. This smoke, or flame perhaps would be the better word for it, was so bright that the deep blue sky overhead and the hazy stretches of brown common towards Jersey, set with black pine trees, seemed to darken abruptly as these puffs arose, and to remain the darker after their dispersal. At the same time, a faint hissing sound became audible. Beyond the pit stood the little wedge of people with the white flag at its apex, arrested by these phenomena a small nut of small vertical black shapes upon the black ground. As the green smoke arose, their faces flashed out pallid green and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a hum, into a long, loud, droning noise. Slowly a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beacon of light seemed to flicker out from Forthwith, flashes of actual flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man was suddenly, momentarily turned to fire. Then, by the light of their own destruction, I saw them staggering and falling, and their supporters turning to run. I stood staring not as yet realizing that this was death leaping from man to man in that little distant air. All I felt was that it was something very strange, an almost noiseless and blinding flash of light, and a man fell headlong and lay still. And as the unseen shaft of heat passed over them, pine trees burst into fire, and every dry furze bush became with one dull thud a mass of flames. And far away towards nothing, I saw the flashes of trees and hedges and wooden buildings suddenly set alight. It was sweeping round swiftly and steadily, this flaming death, this invisible, inevitable sword of heat. I perceived it coming towards me by the flashing bushes it touched, and was too astonished and stupefied to stir. I heard the crackle of fire in the sand pits and the sudden squeal of a horse that was as suddenly still. Then it was as if an invisible, yet intensely heated finger was drawn towards the heather between me and the marshes, and all along a curving line beyond the sand heat pits, the dark ground smoked and crackled. Something fell with a crash far away to the left where the road from Waukee Station opens out upon the common. Forthwith the hissing and humming ceased, and the black dome-like object sank slowly out of sight. All this had happened with such swiftness that I had stood motionless, dumbfounded, and dazzled by the flashes of light. Had that death swept in through a full circle, it must inevitably have slain me in my surprise. But it spared me and passed over me and left the night around me suddenly dark and unfamiliar. The undulating common seemed now dark almost to blackness, except where its roadways lay gray pale under the deep blue sky of the earthy night. It was dark, and suddenly void of light. Overhead the stars were mustering, and in the west a, the sky was still a pale, bright, almost greenish blue. The tops of the pine trees and the roofs of Horsel came out sharp and black against the western afterglow. The Martians and their appliances were altogether invisible, save for that thin mast upon which their restless mirror wobbled. Patches of bush and isolated trees here and there smoked and glowed still, and the houses towards Waukee Station were sending up spires of flame into the stillness of the evening air. Nothing was changed save for that, and a terrible astonishment. The little group of black specks with the flag of white had been swept out of existence, and the stillness of the evening, so it seemed to me, had scarcely been broken. It came to me that I was upon this dark common, helpless, unprotected, and alone. Suddenly, like a thing falling upon me from without, came fear. 
With an effort, I turned and began a stumbling run towards the heaven. The fear I felt was no rational fear, but a panic terror not only of the Martians, but of the dusk and stillness all about me. Such an extraordinary effort in unmanning me it had that I ran weeping silently as a child. Once I had turned, I did not dare to look. I remember I felt an extraordinary persuasion that I was being played with, that presently, when I was upon the very verge of safety, this, this mysterious death, as swift as the passage of light, would leap after me from the pit about the cylinder and strike me down. Chapter 6 it is still a matter of wonder how the Martians are able to slay men so swiftly and so suddenly. Many think that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. This intense heat they project in a para in a parallel in a parallel beam. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition much as the parabolic mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. But no one has absolutely proved these details. However it is done, it is certain that a beam of heat is the essence of the matter. Heat of invisible instead of visible light. Whatever is combustible flashes in the flame of its touch. Lead runs like water. It softens iron, cracks and melts glass, and when it falls upon water, incontinently that explodes into steam. That night, nearly 40 people lay under the starlight about the pit, charged and distorted beyond recognition. And all night long, the common from Horsell to Maybury was deserted and bright with lights. The news of the massacre probably reached Chobham, Walking, and Ottershaw at about the same time. In Walking, the shops had closed when the tragedy happened, and a number of people, shopkeeper and so forth, attracted by the stories they had heard, were walking over the Horsell Bridge and along the road between the hedges that runs out at last upon the common. You may imagine the young people brushed up after the labours of the day, and making this novelty, as they would make any novelty, the excuse for walking together and enjoying a trivial flirtation. You may figure to yourself the hum of voices in the grove of the green. As yet, of course, few people in walking even knew that the cylinder had opened, the poor Henderson had sent a messenger on a bicycle to the post office with a special wire to the evening paper. As these folks came out by twos and threes upon the open, they found little knots of people talking excitedly and peering at the spinning mirror over the sand pits, and the newcomers too, no doubt, soon infected by the excitement of the occasion. By half past eight, when the deputation was destroyed, there may have been a crowd of three hundred people or more at this point, besides those who had left the road to approach the Martians nearer. There were two or three policemen, too, one of whom was mounted, doing their best, under instructions from Stent, to keep the people back and deter them from approaching the cylinder. There was some booing from those more thoughtless and excitable souls, to whom a crowd is always an excuse for a noise and horseplay. Stent and Ogilvy, anticipating some possibilities of a collision, had telegraphed from Horsell to the barracks as soon as the Martians emerged with the help of a company of soldiers to protect these strange creatures from violence. After that, they returned to leave that ill-fated event. The description of their death, as it was seen by the, by the crowd, tallies very closely with my own impressions. The three puffs of green smoke, the deep humming note, the flashes of flame. But that crowd of people had far narrower escape than mine. Only the, fa the fact that a hummock of heathery sand interpreted the lower part of the heat ray saved them. Had the elevation of the parabolic mirror been a few yards higher, none could have lived to tell the tale. They saw the flashes and the men falling, and an invisible hand, as it were, lit the bushes as it hurried towards them through the twilight. Then, with a whistling note that rose above the droning of the pit, the beam swung close over their heads, lighting the tops of the beech trees that lined the road, and splitting the bricks, smashing the windows, firing the window frames, and bringing down a crumbling ruin a portion of the gable of the house in its corner. In the sudden thud, hiss, and glare of the igniting trees, the panic-stricken crowd seems to have swayed hesitatingly for some moments. Sparks and burning twigs began to fall in the void, and single leaves like puffs of flame. Hats and dresses caught fire. Then came a crying from the common, 
There were shrieks and shouts, and suddenly a mounted policeman came galloping through the confusion with his hands clasped over, over his head, screaming, They're coming! A woman shrieked, and incontinently everyone was turning and pushing at those behind in order to clear their way to walking again. They must have bolted as blindly as a flock of sheep. Where the road grows narrow and black between the high banks, the crowd jammed, and a desperate struggle occurred. All that crowd did not escape. Three persons at least, two women and a little boy, were crushed and trampled there, and left to die amid the terror of the darkness. Chapter 7 For my own part, I remember nothing of my flight except the stress of blundering against trees and stumbling through the heather. All about me gathered the invisible terrors of the marshes. That pitiless sword of heat seemed whirling to and fro, flourishing overhead before it descended and smote me like death. I came into the road between the crossroads and Horsham, and ran along this to the crossroads. At last, I could go no further. I was exhausted with the violence of my emotion and of my flight, and I staggered and fell by the wayside. That was near the bridge that crosses the canal by the gas works. I fell and lay still. I must have remained there for some time. I sat up, strangely perplexed. For a moment, perhaps, I could not remember or understand how I came there. My terror had fallen from me like a glove. My hat had gone, and my collar had burst away from its fastening. A few minutes before, there had only been three real things before me. The immensity of the night, space, and nature, my own feebleness and anguish, and the new approach of death. Now it was as if something had turned over, and the point of view altered a bit. There was no sensible transition from one state of mind to the other. I was immediately the self of Frederick Gage, a decent, ordinary citizen. The silent column, the impulsive flight, the starting flames were as if they had been in a dream. I asked myself, had these latter things indeed happened? I could not credit it. I rose and walked unsteadily up the steep incline of the bridge. My mind was blank wonder. My muscles and nerves seemed drained of their strength. I dare say I staggered drunkenly. A head rose over the arch, and the figure of a workman carrying a basket appeared. Beside him ran a little boy. He passed me, wishing me good night. I was minded to speak to him, but did not. I answered his greeting with a meaningless mumble, and went on over the bridge. Of the Maybury Arch a train, a billowing tumult of white, violet smoke, and a long caterpillar of lighted windows, went flying south, clatter, clatter, clap, clap, and in a gun. A dim group of people talked in the gate of one of the houses in a pretty little row of gables that was called Oriental Terrace. It was all so real, so familiar, and that behind me, it was frantic, fantastic. Such things, I told myself, could not be. Perhaps I am a man of exceptional moods. I, I do not know how far my experience has gone. At times I suffer from the strangest sense of detachment from myself and the world about me. I seem to watch it all from the outside, from somewhere inconceivably remote, out of time, out of space, out of stress and tragedy. This feeling was very strong upon me now. Here was another side of my world. But the trouble was the blank incongruity of this serenity and the swift death flying yonder, not two miles away. There was a noise of business from the gas works, and all the electric lamps were alight. I stopped at the group of people. What news from the common? said I. There were two men and a woman at the gate. Eh? said one of the men, turning. What news from the common? I said. Ain't you just been there? asked the men. People seem very silly about the common, said the woman over the gate. What's it all about? Haven't you heard of the men from Mars, said I? The creatures from Mars. Quite enough, said the woman over the gate. Thanks. And all three of them laughed. I felt foolish and angry. I tried and found I could not tell them what I had seen. They laughed again at my broken sentences. You'll hear more yet, I said, and went on to my work. I startled her at the doorway, so haggard was I. I went into the dining room, sat down, drank some wine, and so soon as I could collect myself sufficiently, I told her the things I had seen. 
The dinner, which was a cold one, had already been served, and remained neglected on the table when I told my story. There is one thing, I said, to allay the fears I had aroused. They are the most sluggish creatures I ever saw crawl. They may keep the pits and come and kill people who come near them, but they cannot get out of them with the horror of them. Don't, dear, said my wife, putting her brows upon me, knitting her brows and putting her hand upon mine. Poor Ogilvy, I said, to think he may be lying there dead. My wife, at least, did not find my experience incredible. When I saw how deadly white her face was, I ceased abruptly. They may come here, she said again and again. I pressed her to take wine and tried to reassure her. They can scarcely move, I said. I began to comfort and comfort her and myself by repeating all that Ogilvy had told me of the impossibility of the Martians establishing themselves on the earth. In particular, I laid stress on the gravitational difficulty. On the, sur on the surface of the earth, the force of gravity is three times what it is on the surface of Mars. A Martian, therefore, would weigh three times more than he did on Mars, albeit his muscular strength would be the same. His own body would be a cope of lead to him. That, indeed, was the general opinion. Both the Times and the Daily Telegraph, for instance, insisted on it the next morning, and both overlooked, just as I did, two obvious modifying influences. The atmosphere of the Earth, we now know, contains far more oxygen, or far less argon, whichever way one wants to put it, than does Mars. The invigorating influences of this excess of oxygen upon the Martians indisputably did much to counterbalance the increased weight of their bodies. And, in the second place, we all overlooked the fact that such mechanical intelligence as the Martian possessed was quite able to dispense with muscular exertion at his age. But I did not consider these points at the time, and my reasoning was dead against the chances of the invaders. With wine and food, the confidence of my own table, and the necessity of assuring my wife, I grew by insensible degrees courageous and secure. They have done a foolish thing, said I, fingering my wine glass. They are dangerous because, no doubt, they are mad with terror. Perhaps they expected to find no living being, certainly no intelligent living being. A shell in the pit, I said I, if the worst come the wor comes to the worst, we pull them off. The intense excitement of the events had no doubt left my perceptive powers in a state of erethrism. I remember that dinner table with extraordinary vividness even now. My dear wife's sweet, anxious face peering at me from under the pink lampshade, the white cloth with its silver and glass table furniture, for in those days even philosophical writers had very many little luxuries, the crimson purple wine in my glass, a photographically distinct. At the end of it I sat, thimpering nuts with a cigarette, regretting Ogilvy's rashness and denouncing the short-sightedness timidity of the Martians. So some respectful dodo in the Mauritius might have lorded it in its nest and discussed the arrival of that shipful of pitiless sabers and want of animal food. We will peck them to death tomorrow, my dear. I did not know it, but that was the last civilized dinner I was to eat for many strange and terrible days. Ladies and gentlemen, the first seven chapters of the War of the Worlds by H. G. Wells on this World Science Fiction Week. Here at the Morgan Library, we keep many copies, and there are many copies scheduled throughout our library system. Please avail yourself of them and enjoy World Science Fiction Month. For all you lovers of Asimov, Herbert, 